Hi guys and welcome to, to module three of the Mishcon Sports Law Academy. We are, we are really over the moon with the feedback and the engagement we've received so far. I don't know whether it's because it's miserable outside or whether there's a, a deadly strain of coronavirus sweeping the nation or because you all just genuinely do love sports law, but we've had uh, over 450 participants sign up for today's session. Now today's session, it was marketed as an in-house council forum, but it's probably quite a lot of you wondering, what does that mean? Well, there's, there's, there's two main goals for today's session. Firstly, our esteemed panel, who I'm going to introduce shortly, they'll be sharing some insights and a bit of background about their career and providing some practical tips and advice on how to pursue an alternative career in sports law outside of private practice. Uh, the second objective of today's session is for the panel to provide some insights on how to make the most of internal and external legal advisors. Now, as always, we want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So please do make the most of the Q&A function and um, should be able to access it at the bottom of your screen. My, uh, my colleague, Simon Leaf, is going to, be, going to be viewing that and he's going to be passing on questions to the panel um, and also trying to respond to some of your questions as they come through. We'll, we'll do our best to try and get through as many of these as possible. Um, but if there's something you're not clear of after the event, uh, please feel free to email me or, or Simon and we, can, and we can do our best to answer them. So without further ado, I want to introduce some of the brightest minds in, in sports law today. And I've spoken to each of our panelists this week and I can't tell you how impressive they are. We've got one that speaks over five languages and you can guess, guess who that is. Uh, we've got, we've got two that work at two of the top football clubs in the UK. And we have a third who is a former professional athlete. So first up, I'm going to introduce Zoe Sullivan, who is head of legal at Southampton Football Club. Um, she should be seen. She's in the middle of my screen, so if you give us a wave. Thanks. <laughs> uh, we're also joined by Poonam. Sorry, Poonam, I'm going to have to ask you how to pronounce your, your surname. Medicia. Medicia, there you go. Yeah. I was going to completely mispronounce that. <laughs> Who's legal counsel at Chelsea Football Club. And we also welcome Emma Mason, who is vice president of strategic and external affairs at the World Federation of the Sporting Goods Industry. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that our panel has changed slightly to what was advertised. Um, Liz has sadly had to um, drop out because she couldn't participate due to work commitments. Um, so I'm going to get today's session started off with just giving a bit of an overview about what each of our panellists do. So Zoe, perhaps you could, could start us off. I'm sure everyone listening knows who Southampton Football Club are, but could you just give us a quick overview of your role and the type of work you do day to day? Oh, wow. What don't I do? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm head of legal, um, but we sort of encompass pretty much uh, every touch point in the business. Um, so, you know, legal's involved with pretty much everything. So days can be, days are never dull, let's put it that way. Um, but probably a bit like Poonan, we, we sort of get everything and anything across our desks. Um, so, yeah. It's vast and wide ranging, definitely. But yeah, legal in our department, I don't know about Chelsea, but we have kind of a compliance and regulatory sort of um, part of us as well. So it's sort of a legal and risk team, which encompasses legal, but it also has health and safety and safeguarding within it as well. So we're a bit of a not compliance focused, but that is obviously a very part, a big part of what we do as well. Puna, how does that compare to your role at, at Chelsea? I, I understand you, yours is sort of a bit more divided amongst into different sort of departments. Yeah, I mean, our department deals with sort of similar issues um, as Zoe, Zoe mentioned. Um, we have kind of the commercial arm of it and then also the more regulatory and compliance arm of it. Um, in terms of how we are split up, so there are six of us um, and um, on the kind of commercial side, which is the bit that I work in, we uh, look after various departments. So uh, we have, so I personally would have a relationship with a set number of departments, um, but it's very wide ranging. So I look after a number of the commercial departments such as broadcasting, uh, merchandise, e-commerce, but I also look after a number, number of the operational departments too. So like uh, security, health and safety, um, HR. Um, and I also look after the club's brand protection portfolio. Fantastic. And, and Emma, for those who might not have heard of the World Federation of the Sports and Goods Industry, would you mind just giving a, a brief introduction about the type of work you do and also your role? Because I understand you have more of an operational role as opposed to, to a, so being a lawyer now. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, so 
the World Federation of the Sporting Goods Industry, we really do have what the world's worst name. So technically, we you just usually refer to it as WFSGI. It's much easier. And, and we're probably not as straightforward to understand it as a football club structure. We are, in our essence, a, a trade body, so a trade representative association. Um, we're the only global uh, association that exists for sporting goods companies. Um, we're structured very similarly to an in, a traditional international sports federation. So we have uh, members, um, so we're a not-for-profit member-based association, but instead of having the national sports federations as our members, we have private sporting goods companies. So, and we only take into membership the global parent companies. So within our membership base, we have uh, the biggest in our industry. So the Nikes, the Adidas, the Antas, the Asics, and they're always the, the global parent companies. And the reason for that is because we have um, continental confederations uh, that represent uh, the, the European or the American based um, bodies for those, those brands. And we also have national federations. Um, and so our role is really on a global level. Um, and there's two parts of the business. Um, one part is the kind of back of house. So we uh, represent consensus view of our members um, on things like manufacturing, trade, legal and supply chain issues. Again, always at the global level. So with bodies like the World Trade Organization and the World Customs Union. And I work very much on the front of house on the sports side of things. And um, so my role is predominantly it's not a legal role. I don't work as a lawyer there, um, but my role is predominantly to represent the consensus view of the brands, um, so of the industry, towards key stakeholders in the sports sector. So the International Sport Federations, the International Olympic Committee, the International Paralympic Committee, and then again uh, to represent and work very closely um, on sport and physical activity topics towards the UN agencies. So a little bit different um, to what I used to do in private practice, um, but hopefully I can uh, share some viewpoints with you this evening that will be helpful. Amazing. Uh, you, you've all got incredibly interesting sounding jobs. And one of the things that lots of people have already messaged and emailed us about already is, is trying to learn a little bit more about your, your backgrounds and how you became a lawyer. Because I think if you look at each of you up on, on LinkedIn, you've each got incredible CVs. And I think a lot of people see a career progression as very much a linear progression um, where you know you start off you get give it off opportunities and it just continues to get better and better but um, from speaking to each of you we all had quite different backgrounds and Emma I'm going to start with you if that's okay because I think yours is perhaps the most fascinating from an outsider's perspective so, so you were a professional athlete Yes, um, I was. I always get very daunted when someone says it's fascinating I feel I have to live up to it <laughs> Um, but no, yes, I was a, a professional badminton player. And for those of you thinking, yes, that does exist. Badminton is a, an Olympic sport, everything else. I always get asked that question. Um, yeah, I, I played up until I was around about 24 years old. And then I um, retired after the Commonwealth Games in 2010. And I was studying chemistry at the time and um, really not enjoying it and, and sort of struggling to work out, okay, what am I going to do here? I wasn't one of those athletes that had a full life plan um, for when I retired. And um, I shared with Tom when we talked this week, it was actually um, one of those strange moments in life uh, where my old strength and conditioning coach sent me some, some books to read because um, I actually had an injury and that's why I retired. And one of them was this book, <coughs> excuse me, about the Barry Balco, um, the Barry Bonds and the Marion Jones scandal. So it's called the Bal uh, Balco scandal in um, relation to anti-doping um, based uh, with a guy who started it all called Victor Conte. And uh, for whatever reason, I read this book and I thought, you know what, this is it. I've nailed it. I'm doing chemistry. And this has got, you know, some kind of interesting aspects towards a, a legal career. So after reading this book, some would say on a whim, I feel like it was well researched, but I'm not actually sure if that's accurate. I decided, okay, I'm going to retrain as a lawyer and, and, and go into to anti-doping work. Um, so that was really my, my sort of journey towards law. Of course, there's been a, a few twists and turns since then, but that, that was really the decision-making process. And Emma, so how did you, how did you go from, from studying chemistry to then, to then decide, you know, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move across and become, become focused as an anti-doping lawyer? Who, was there anyone in particular sort of who, who inspired you to do that? 
Yeah, so other than this book that I read, I was also at the time, and this is a very personal experience, but I was also at the time um, what's called the Athletes Commission Chair for the World Badminton Federation. So any of you who are familiar with the, the Olympic movement or Olympic sport, you may know that um, every international federation is required by the, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, to have a body um, that is separate from, from the, the governance structure of the International Federation and which represents the interests of the athletes um, towards the board. And uh, at the time that I retired, I was the chair of that commission and that, um, that entitled me to, to a seat at, this, at the board. So, so the board that governs the World Badminton Federation, so the rules and regulations by which the global sport is run. And it was, uh, again, I shared with Tom this week, it was uh, both a terrifying and an amazing opportunity. I joined a board um, with some incredible figures within the Olympic movement industry, one of whom is now the CEO of Paris 2024. And I was 24, 25 years old and had never been in a meeting, let alone a board meeting. So I had no clue what I was doing. Um, but it really that experience together with sort of my chemistry background and, and this feeling that I wanted to retrain as something post-athletic career uh, and the knowledge that I enjoyed this representative role that I was doing, that's really what shaped my thought process that, okay, you know what, I, I'm going to take a punt here and I'm going to retrain as a lawyer. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize the accent, I'm Scottish. So <laughs> at that time I had to make a decision. Do I, um, do I retrain for... I think it's about six or seven years is the full journey if you stay in Scotland or, or do I go to England and do um, you know the graduate diploma in law and then the LPC and maybe because I was a bit older maybe because I was impatient and um, I took the English route um, and I took some time obviously you know to try to apply for training contracts etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and that was really how I ended up uh, being in London um, working in private practice. Amazing thanks Emma. And um, Pinam, did you did you fancy yourself as a professional athlete? <laughs> no, definitely not. No, no. So my background, um, yeah, is um, quite a bit different to Emma's. So I, um, so I actually studied languages at university. So I did French and German at university, um, but that was sort of brought about by football. So when I was at school. Uh, I was obsessed with football and one of my French teachers she used to bring back copies of France football um, when she used to go back to France for me to read um, and yeah that's when I sort of really got into learning languages and sort of you know it kind of felt like there was a link you know football is quite international um, and yes yeah, so I did French and German at university but at that stage I was looking at a career like I wanted a career where I could travel a lot and I was looking at kind of a career in foreign diplomacy um, I did some work experience in Brussels at the European Parliament um, and then I decided that I didn't like Brussels very much as a city like personal perspective there <laughs> but um, yeah I couldn't see myself there um, and um, yeah and then the then I sort of looked at the foreign office um, but um, with the foreign office it, it kind of involves um, you know every two years you've got to go somewhere new um, and a lot of the places you, you went you could end up are quite challenging like you know Afghanistan Iraq it, it can be a quite challenging environment to be in um, and then I sort of looked at um, yeah going into law because it um, kind of meant you could um, yeah qualify into something um, you could yeah practice, practice a, a wide array of kind of different uh, legal areas and um, yeah you could yeah the, a lot of the kind of big city firms or big commercial firms that like, had really good travel opportunities and international clients so that was yeah so that, it was sort of in my final year of the university that that's what I decided I want to go into what wanted to go into. And Pilam you, you managed to travel whilst doing your training contract is that right? Yes, I did. Yes. So I, I trained at CMS and um, CMS have a really good um, scheme for like people who want to go on secondment. Um, and I managed to spend um, six months at the Rio office. So they had an office out in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so, yeah, that was really, really good, like a really good experience. Oh, amazing. And, and Zoe, what about you? What was your, your route into law? Into law? Um, I sort of ended up doing it probably the very standard way, really. Went to, to uni, did the law degree and did it at Surrey in Guildford. Um, it seemed quite natural to then go and do my College of Law in Guildford too. So I sort of stuck around um, 
sort of in the traditional route, then looked for training contracts. And um, sort of while I was kind of looking for those, I, I managed to get a paralegal role at Shoesmiths um, in Reading at the time in um, real estate. So I worked in worked there, started to get a bit of experience because one of the things that I kept getting told quite early on, which I'm sure a lot of you, a lot of participants may be told is you don't have any experience and you know, how do we know how good you are and how, you know, all of this. So I was like, well, okay, well, I've got to start getting some experience then so thought a paralegal route would at least give me that opportunity because training contracts are always a good couple of years wait um so then while I was there I'm still finding it quite sort of um I was doing my LPC part-time as well so I was working sort of full-time did wow. the weekend LPC for two years um to sort of so I didn't get myself into any more debt so I sort of could pay for it as I went along that was quite demanding and really quite challenging <laughs> um but it, it was what you know I'm glad I did it because I kind of got the practical and the kind of um educational aspects sort of at the same time which actually was quite funny really while I was kind of studying one aspect while I was working in family law at the time at one point and then I was also studying it and that was really strange because they completely didn't match up at all of what I was doing in practice as opposed to what I was being told happened in practice so that was quite amusing as well um the teacher didn't appreciate my view there um and then yeah so from there I kind of from she smiths I kind of moved into litigation sort of real estate litigation um got sponsored by my manager to do a training contract so I went for an internal one then um I, I got it um and then I ended up when I started my training contract um moving from Reading to the Southampton office down in um down here um to Shoesmith still um mainly personal reasons i married now but my uh my not not husband then but I moved down here sort of to be nearer him so it kind of worked out quite well um and then sort of during my training contract, I did some secondments, um, which is always a really good opportunity as well to do. And I'd always say do them if you can. So one of one of the main ones I did for six months was to a GS insurance. Um, and that was really, really, I really enjoyed it. And I really got a real taste for working in house because I'd only ever been in private practice to seeing that one view. Um, came back, completed my training contract. There wasn't any commercial roles. Um, it was when I was qualifying in a time where it was quite hard to, to get a private practice commercial job. Um, so I decided that I, I didn't want to do planning just for the sake of it, because that was all that was being offered to me at the time to stay at Shoesmith. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So said I was going to leave. Um, and just out of sort of curiosity, I contacted my previous kind of line line manager at GS to see if they had any any openings and weird weird timing wise or fate if, if you know, if you believe in that, um, they were actually recruiting. So I uh, applied and got the job there. Um, so then went in-house directly from qualification, which uh, again, a lot of people um, find quite find quite rare um, and that doesn't always happen. But for me, it was, it, it fitted really well and um, I, I'm quite glad I did it. Um, but then, yeah, so then 18 months in, I wasn't really looking, I was approached for about a role at Southampton Football Club. Um, kind of thought in a giggly way no there's no way I'm going to get that I know nothing about football um never really you know never could have dreamed I would have got a position like that so went for the went for the uh, interview again I sort of knew a bit about the club and you know you do your research don't you but I didn't know really anything about our league position on that day and actually it was really good we were doing really well at that point um as well because <laughs> it was 2016 and it was the year that we ended up qualifying for Europe but um wow. it, yeah so I, I was offered the role which I was actually really amazed about <laughs> because I didn't um I thought not knowing anything about football was probably going to be a, a black mark against me but actually it, it didn't make a difference um and which do, was actually do, you find, a really positive. do you find you can by not necessarily as being so wedded and in love with the in love with the sort of background of the business that allows you as a lawyer to take more objective views on things and allows you to to not necessarily um make partial decisions because you're 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 a bit further removed from the situation um i would say yes but then once you're kind of in it you kind of really get embedded into the uh into football so now i'm a massive fan and i am um, <laughs> so no i mean either way um my you know i i I'm here to protect the business. I'm here to, that's my job. Um, so I'll always, 
you have to kind of take the personal view out of it uh, as hard as it is um, or question things and think why are we doing that but actually there's always a reason or a strategy behind it so um, no I think it's hard not to get involved in in the football side once you're in and because it's just in all encompassing and what you're there to do really it all adds to everybody being on the pitch and playing that's what you're here to achieve to get everybody there yeah play well. I, and and Emma you did some really interesting secondments a bit like Zoe and uh, and, and like Puna you, you've all had the benefit of doing some pretty amazing secondments could you tell us a bit about those yeah, um, well, actually, I was seconded to, to Puna's employee um, for about eight months during my training contract. So um, so maybe I'll just explain. Um, it, it's, I was working at Squire Patton Boggs in London before um, before I left the law. And during our training contract was structured on um, four months uh, seats. So sometimes that's a bit unusual. I think it's typically six months in London. Um, I guess you have to assess that, um, you know, on the call are looking for training contracts you know do you want uh, longer in a particular seat or do you want to, to rotate around more um, and within our sports department um, the head of our, our sports department had a very good um, very good relationship with Chelsea at the time and they were looking for for an in-house secondee because um, they just uh, hired James Bonington which is now the GC of Chelsea I think and I think I just heard that Rob has been promoted to, to head of legal um, which is great news and, and they were looking for a trainee to sort of help them you know establishing their legal uh, team within there so it was really one of those perfect timing opportunities and um, you know I'd come with the sports background I never managed to do a day of anti-doping law um, uh, if we have time I can go into that <laughs> the reason yeah, please do please do yeah and um, I, I, and so I, I went to Chelsea you know as a, as a I think a third seat trainee and um, so you know really just entering my my, my second year and um I, I had such a fantastic experience there. I also was, had the privilege to go to, to Villa when I was an associate for a couple of months. Um, and I think the thing for me that differentiates um, being in-house versus uh, private practice, and Zoe touched on it just there, it's that you're all pulling for the same team, you know? And I don't mean that as a pun, sorry. I, you know, it, it is every single person in the business, no matter whether you're working in the legal capacity or you're selling tickets or, or, or um, you know, you're the groundsman, you're all there with a vested interest in how the club, the brand, the team, you know, do it the weekend or how, you know, how it's performing. And, and I really, uh, from my perspective, without going into the legal aspects, because I, I did a variety of work when I was in-house, uh, but Puna and, uh, and Zoe can, can talk to that much better than I can. For me, the, the, the most exciting uh, element of being in-house was this real blend of sport, business, law, and a little bit of politics, because you have this internal politics, you know, between the commercial arm and then the, the football arm. And, and all of this blend for me was something, it, it fascinated me and it, it still fascinates me. I, I have a, a lot of that in my, in my work right now, you know, the mix between the competitive brands that I work with and how to, to bring them to a consensus position, um, you know, to, to represent their the industry viewpoint um so I, I mean from my perspective i'm not sure if you want more than just an overview of my, my feeling of in-house um which is what i seem to have delivered sorry I, I don't know. politicians answer you asked me a question i forgot i answered what i wanted to answer um, so, Matt Hancock on it. Um, you know i think there you go that's the one i've answered is that i think the key differentiator for me is it is this you're all on the same team, which I found, you know, fantastic. I, I love that element. It's probably from my athletic background. I, I, I love feeling like I'm working for the same goal as everybody around me. Um, and then this really fascinating mix of, of business, sport, law and politics is, is, a, is a really great learning opportunity as well. And Emma, you secured yourself a transfer from Chelsea and then across to, to Aston Villa, didn't you? So was that a, <laughs> tell us a bit about that transfer. What was the fee? <laughs> yeah, um, well, if I tell you, as I shared with Tom, that I had to live on the bull ring in Birmingham. I'm not sure if it's an international group or, or a national group here. So Apologies to people from Birmingham or to, to Brussels today. No, no criticism of Birmingham, but it is, I did live on a roundabout for two months. Um, so, you know, it was... Um, it was different, different people, different uh, club, obviously uh, different values and, and a different 
without um, without being negative, a different uh, level of performance of club, and I think a different commercial reality as well. That that's also important to acknowledge, um, which does affect um, not necessarily in a negative way, but does affect the day to day business that you're doing, the the constraints or, or otherwise that you're under. But my general perspective was the same. Okay, you know, you you you're in Chelsea. You're in the Chelsea family. Um, you're in. Um, you're in Villa, you're in the Villa family. And it's, Zoe, I think it was you that, that, that mentioned it. You almost lose sight of the fact of whether you were a football fan before or whether you knew where Villa was on the table before. Because by the time you're there a week, you know every yeah. single statistic about every single <laughs> match that you've played in the last six months. It's, it's um, learning by osmosis. You know, uh, it, it's talked about so much around you. It's almost impossible not to, to, to be caught up in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to actually answer your question this time. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, two fantastic opportunities, two very different clubs, two very different commercial realities. My work was very similar, I have to say, um, you know, maybe there was um, some different nuances at each club, depending on the situation they were in. Um, but yeah, a, a very broad experience that I gained there and, and, and really very enjoyable all, all around. Fantastic. And Poonam, have you, have you been converted to, to a Chelsea fan from Leicester City? Do you, do you, do you find yourself as a sort of person invested as Zoe and, and Emma have found themselves? Uh, yeah, you know, you, you definitely do get invested. And I do remember, so it's quite funny, I think in our legal team, nobody started off as a Chelsea fan. So everyone who's joined just happened not to be a Chelsea fan. Um, but I, I do remember Rob um, saying to me, you know, the, the longer you're here, you, you'll get more invested and you'll become a fan. And, you know, I'm still a massive Leicester fan, but... I do have a vested interest in what's going on at Chelsea, of course. And yeah, and as Emma says, like, you know, every, like there's a real good atmosphere around kind of the building, you know, when we're in the building, obviously, um, uh, you know, when the, when the results are good and, and the team is playing well, like, mm -hmm. you know, it sort of permeates throughout the building. So, uh, so yeah, you, you do sort of feel invested in it. And, and Puna, how did you find your transition from, from private practice to in-house? And what did, you, what did you see as the sort of the key distinguishing features? Yeah, no, it was an interesting one. So I, I did have some in-house um, experience before I joined Chelsea. So I spent a bit of time um, at the British Olympic Association, so Team GB during um, Rio 2016. And um, so I sort of knew what to expect in terms of, you know, you, you are in a more commercial environment rather than a legal environment and you are closer to the business. Um, and I think one of the things, yeah, one of the biggest differences I find is that you're involved in the kind of business making decisions. So you're looking at it from a commercial perspective. You're not sort of you're not sort of distance and just looking at it like, you know, what is the legal position? Um, you know, what, what must what's the kind of right thing to do legally? You're sort of yeah. thinking about you know, you are sort of um, collaborating with the other people, um, like, you know, the, the sponsorship team, the marketing team, um, the kind of safety and operation side to work out what is kind of the best solution commercially and like, you know, what is best for the club. Um, so, yeah, I think that's been interesting um, in terms of challenges and sort of differences. I, I think the main one is, you know, as Zoe said, anything and everything can come, come across your desk. Like, you know, one minute you're dealing with like, you know, a big like, I don't know, merchandising agreement or sponsorship agreement, the next minute you've got, you know, um, a query that might not come across as legal at first, but you've sort of got to delve into it and, and think about, you know, what the request is. Um, and also just understanding that, you know, you're not dealing with lawyers on a day-to-day -day basis, you're dealing with different teams who have different skill sets um, and trying to make sure you can explain like a legal position in a way that they can understand and in a way that they can understand how it affects them. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say that those were like sort of the key differences. And so I can see you not not long in the background there. Do, do you do you think there's been a, a big change um, adopting a sort of a more commercial mindset from a legal mindset? And, and what does that what does that kind of mean for someone that might not necessarily understand? I think I, I I've you know when I was sort of very when I was junior and I was starting out, you sort of have a not an idealistic kind of view of I'm going to change the world and all of this sort of stuff. But I think you know. I never was the type of person even in the training aspects that I I found writing kind of legal like pure legal advice um quite sort of I don't know not daunting but I thought I thought well 
I, I need I felt like I needed to know more I felt like I was being really nosy because I wanted to know okay well, what's the goal what are we doing why are we doing this who else is doing what why is this person doing this does it affect what someone else is doing over there and I think um and all like you know a lot of the time I was like well that's not really relevant for this set of terms and conditions or this set of um yeah. advice that you're going to give um and I and I was like, oh, okay. And then I always felt like I wanted to kind of know more about the business. What are we trying to achieve? What's our goals? What's this, you know, what's our vision? Um, so when I was going in house, that was the thing I really, um, and when I did my secondments, um, I did a small one to British American Tobacco as well. And, you know, it's very similar in house sort of aspects, but you get to know so much more because you're, you are just more of a business advisor as opposed to a legal advisor. Did you become That's a big, did you the- become a big smoker then? <laughs> no um I wasn't there for very long I was only sort of doing it a day a week to help out but it was an interesting uh to see another in-house kind of um in-house company and how different they are because they're very large and um they're huge absolutely huge I, I didn't really understand how you could it was so many people everywhere um whereas sort of Aegeus was a bit of a smaller group um it was quite a big legal team in comparison to sort of what where I'm at now there's sort of me um my trainee and then we've got a sort of an NQ as well and you know and that's the three of us and everyone's a lot of the time thinking wow is that is that it and you guys sort of service the entire business like yes that's it that's just us um but um but yeah I I loved I, I I always see myself more as as a business advisor and I think that's the kind of the step as you're kind of progressing in in in-house and and progressing probably more and more senior you get that's kind of the role you kind of adopt as opposed to being a legal a straight lawyer I I don't think I really talk a lot of legal lingo or legal advice you know I don't talk about law as such anymore I kind of just sort of talk and give advice and just say yeah no yeah yeah that's okay have we thought about doing it this way could we tweak it slightly and um we're very solutions focused and we don't like to say no because legal already has especially in like an in-house environment can have a a barrier blocker kind of um sort of notion not always and you know we work you work very hard to make sure that that's not the perception um but yeah the last thing you want is people in the business not coming to legal because yes. they're scared like oh yeah. they're gonna say no so yeah yeah exactly cool. emma what was I'd, I'd be interested to get your perspective on this because you you've made the sort of the the, the double transition um into into a you know an in-house legal role and then into a non-legal role and and how did you find how do you see the, the, the differences between those two roles do you think you you again become more inquisitive and more sort of solutions focused. How do you how did you find it? Um, well, I went after Villa after my time on the bull ring. I went I actually went back to private practice for about a year year and a bit, and then um, and then I and then I did the transition. And I think what Zoe said actually rings really true. Um, and I'll never forget the, the the second week in my current job. Um, and as I said before, you you know my role is to work with these different brands that are naturally com- commercial competitors and, and find consensus solutions on things that are so- certainly sometimes quite tricky, like marketing and advertising regulations. And I wrote this uh, very long email to this group of uh, sports marketing directors. Um, about a very important um, rule within the Olympic movement, which is called Rule 40. It's about use of your athlete imagery. It's always contentious come the Olympic Games. And, you know, I, from my private practice world, you know, I thought I'd written a very good email. It was, you know, it, everything made sense. It was bullet points, you know, not huge long paragraphs, but it was still, you know, if you print it out, it was like two sides of A4, and there was all these things in it that I thought were important to say so that they knew I knew what I was talking about. I remember my boss came around and he said, you can't send emails like that. And he was like, these guys are global sports marketing directors. They want to read your email in two minutes. They want to know what the key point is and whether they're right or wrong and whether we're going forwards or not. And he was like, nobody cares if you know the law backwards or the regulation backwards or you're right. They just want to understand, are we going forwards? Yes or no? Uh, and I think after that, I, it was actually um, incredibly useful that I'd had this time at Chelsea and at Villa because I sort of knew how to switch into that mode of going, okay, guys, like, you, you know, we need to talk about this. It's very serious, it's regulatory, but, and, and, you know, we need to talk about the implications for you as brands, for the industry, but we're going to talk in very simple terms that actually translate into the area of work that you're doing. So, and so, so for me now, I and mean, we do work with lawyers on a regular basis. Um, 
And the communication, and I, I guess we're going to come on to that, the communication between that I have on a particular topic, so let's take rule 40 because I've started with it, the, the message that I will give out to the brands, to the sports marketing guys, might ultimately say the same thing, but the communication to them will be radically different to what I either sent out to the external lawyer or received. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's, it's um, you know, brands have actually nailed this, you know, it, it's communicating to the correct audience. I think, um, and I, I don't want to, to sound like someone harking back because I haven't been in law for a while, but I think that's something the legal sector really needs to improve, like tailoring its content to its audience, you know, because um, what I, uh, if I was in-house, was sending to Chelsea, for example, uh, versus Southampton, which should, would and should be different uh, because of the different natures of the club, the different business perspectives. And I think as a lawyer, a modern day lawyer, um, you must understand that to be successful, in, in, in my view. And how do you think we can change that? How do you think we can change the sort of the legalistic mentality let's call it that that you need to cover off every point and it's better to have a two-page email that covers off every single point and make sure you've and shows the client you've considered every single eventuality how how can we how can we change that and, and put it more to adopt the in-house style and to, to think know what are the actual problems that need to be solved here and how do we take the key pieces of information and answer the question or ask ask perhaps a different question. Poonam, what do you what do you think about that? Um, so I think things like secondments really help, like for private practice lawyers, um, like sort of in the more junior stages in their careers, being able to go on to comment in house to see how it works, because they'll be able to understand, um, you know, this is how the business works, this is what they really need. Um, this is um, this is the kind of thing that like um you know the, the business needs to make a decision on um and then i think i think a lot of it is also around presentation like how do, how you present your advice um you know like often when advice comes in it, it ends up being like four or five long paragraphs um when really like you know what what might be more helpful is like a table like um a kind of um like distinguishing distinguishing different approaches by risk um, and yet yeah, looking for the solution. So the key thing is, you know, like, yeah, knowing the kind of background legal position is is important. And I, I sort of understand where Emma's coming from, because when I was in private practice, I was the same. I wanted to make sure that that um, the person I was advising knew that I, I had covered everything, that I had thought about everything. But actually what 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 kind of needs to be the top line part of that advice is this is what you can do or this is what you can't do or you can do it but you can do it in these three ways like that it, it's more about the kind of the way you word your advice so mm. i think i think um yeah that i think that's something that private practice lawyers should think about so so we've, got, we've had some fantastic tips there on, on for how people working in private practice can improve the advice they offer to to, to clients mm. but just to sort of to switch it around do you have any advice for non-legal professionals so people working within businesses within clubs within federations on how they can make the most of in-house counsel and if you could make sort of one internal change to improve the service that you're able to offer what would that be <laughs> oh blimey that's a hard one um so no the i suppose for people to you to utilize their in-house counsel properly i'd always say just get us involved in the conversations as early as possible i think a lot of people have this kind of in thing that thinks, oh, well, it's not a contract. We don't need legal involved. And majority of the time in projects, especially if it's something very long, actually it helps to have us even at tender stages when you're looking for an app provider, because we'll ask questions that other people in the business won't even consider, you know, around information security, data protection, confidentiality, you know, things like they'll, it's stuff that we actually would know to ask and cover and actually should be a scorable kind of, you know whether or not they should win or not or win a bid it's only afterwards they haven't involved you and you ask lots of questions and they're like <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know I should ask that I was like yes and that's why you should involve us early um so I'd say you know legal is probably the area in a, in a business which touches I think I said it earlier we we touch pretty much every area of the business in some shape or form and even if that's just sitting in a meeting sitting on a call it's not just about you know drafting contracts is probably this the smallest part of our role now you know we have to do that it is something that is a necessity um for the amount of 
of sort of churn work I suppose that you might have but even the more ex ex exciting sexy stuff like the big sponsors and things like that but having just our advice and having our presence in the room to kind of ask those questions earlier can make a massive bit of difference and actually we're here to we're here to protect the business protect you guys um and we're here to be a massive support not a hindrance really do you, th do you think that that early engagement is perhaps an antidote to to legal being seen as a blocker because rather than rather than legal coming in last minute and saying wait a second no you can't do this because of state protection risk if they have been engaged at an early stage they can perhaps help influence those decisions I think it's a bit of both. I think um, I think it's less about the blocker now. I think it's that everybody has their own skill sets in their individual teams, and I think they'll know their area inside out really, really well. But they so they'll think it's all right. I know this. I know what I need to do. I need. I know what I need to check off with this potential supplier or this potential sponsor or this potential bit of, of something. But they don't because they're not considering. It's just that they don't consider something that maybe they don't know they don't know how, what to ask if that makes sense yeah. so you know when if, if it's something to do with marketing for instance they you know there's you might know oh yeah data might is an, is something you need to ask but actually because you won't know the in-depth of I don't know it's being transferred from a country where you'd need different types of contractual sort of protections and they won't know you know I wouldn't expect them to know that um you know that they'd have to make sure can we do this you know all of this and what kind of things we need to consider or or even asking me like do you have cyber essentials you have an ISO kind of certification for information security for example or cyber for cyber security it's not stuff that you kind of would expect someone in marketing to know but I suppose it's kind of a probably a, a two-way streak of kind of training and sort of not mentoring but it's kind of that kind of conversation and communication piece to keep it open at all times yeah so i think one of the one of the often you just you, do, you know you don't know what you don't know as so many people often say and yeah. and it can be difficult for people who, who aren't aware of certain things to, to necessarily be alive mm -hmm. to those risks in every single instance yeah i think i think also as well because we touch so many different things in the business we're we're a useful asset to have in the room because not everyone will know that the football side's about to do something with a player or a film with a legend. They're not going to know that that could have this potential thing could affect the prize draw that they want to do on that particular day, or it could affect the the event that's going to go on in one of the suites because they're not they're not aware of it, and yeah. they're, they're not aware who they need to speak to to make sure that they can get clearance to do things like that. So we're we're actually a very helpful asset and probably the same experience that Poonan has. And you know, us being in the room is helpful because we probably know more about what's going on yeah. across the whole business wide. That and you sort of say, have you spoken to them because they're doing that? And they're like, are they? So it's it's we're you know it's getting that yeah, message that, across that, that actually comes to me on a weekly basis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> same. <laughs> And, and, and Puna, what, what change would you like to see sort of internally to improve the service that, that you're able to offer? And, and do you have any advice for, for, for non-legal professionals and how to make the most of, of in-house counsel? Do you know, I thought about this question um, quite a bit. And like the biggest thing for me is exactly what Zoe said about instructing us early, because like when you get a contract the day before something is, needs to be signed, you know, please, can you look at this? It needs to be signed tomorrow what you're doing is a plaster sticking exercise like you're doing just the, the minimum you can do to make sure that you're you're covering the club but when you get like involved early even when there's no contract yet even when it's just a project and you don't think that there's any legal issues um you can really sort of um yeah start to advise the business on you know like why are we using that structure wouldn't it be better to do it this way um what you know why yeah um you know, you know why have we chosen this this supplier for example or you know this other department's had an issue before um you know you want to make sure that that doesn't happen again um so from that perspective like yeah getting us involved early is is really really important um, and that that is also helpful for us to sort of understand how the business operates and that just makes it better like in terms of how we do our jobs um probably the second area is around kind of like um certain queries that come across that tend to be repeat queries um and I, and I think that's just more of a knowledge sharing point so I think with a lot of um parts of the business um 
like one of the things that um, we need to look at really is like making sure that we're being utilized on the kind of bigger projects and the bigger things and the more important things and where you've got certain queries that are coming across again and again like how can we train the business to make sure that they that they can deal with those themselves and uh, yeah d deal with those queries themselves and um like are, are sort of able to understand that without without needing legal support um so yeah just making sure that we're utilized more effectively yeah, fantastic. And Emma, what's your perspective on this? Because you, again, you've had the sort of view of all sides. So, do you do you do you feel you're in a more advantageous position having had the legal background because you you do engage counsel early, or you do you do know when to speak to the lawyers and, and when not to? Has, has that helped you in your career? Do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, more broadly than, you know, when or when not to instruct lawyers, um, absolutely the legal career has, has helped me. Um, you know, I'm still doing a lot of regulatory work and, and I think everybody who has been through a law degree knows it changes the way you view things and it changes the way you think and, and structure your mind in terms of your work. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what Zoe and Puna said about the, the internal. I mean, my recollection of being in the clubs was that law is kind of like the horizontal, you know, it, it go, the legal services or the legal team goes right across the full club. And, and it tended to be that ticketing and marketing and everything else, they work in kind of silos and you, you have to kind of make that um, connection for them between the, the, the different in-house teams. I mean, I think now for me, when I'm working with external counsel, um, because we don't actually have an in-house uh, capacity. Um, I think the biggest thing I, I, I learned um, both through in-house and, and through private practice and in trying to get the answers or, or effective answers from, from private practice is, is the value of taking time to explain not only the legal question, but the context or the business context in which it arises it's sometimes surprising to me how a little thing that I might mention in an email um, you know, about a particular nuance that's happening or a particular element of the, the instruction that I'm making. It's very rarely a legal aspect, but it can radically change the quality of the, the advice you get back. And, and I think to, to Puna's point earlier, um, you know, when I'm instructing legal counsels broadly in two situations, one, there's something extreme going on. So we are under pressure. Uh, we're under pressure from our members. We're under pressure from our board. And we need an answer quickly that's easily digestible and ideally can be shared without me doing anything to it. You know, uh, that's, that sounds a little bit lazy, but that's the reality of the situation is that I have gone external to, to private practice because I need help. That, that that's um you know it, it's not because I, I don't want to do the work. It's simply that I want to receive something that is immediately ready to go internally. And to it's make very, your life easier almost. Yeah, because I am going out because I am under pressure. So people are telling me, where is that advice? We need that, we need this now. And, and I don't have time to do the translation exercise from uh, legal speak into business speak. And, and I think it does, the quality of the advice and the, let's say the, the di oh, that's not a word I was about to say digestibility for people on the call that is not a word I don't think. <laughs> um, the, the the usability let's use it that way let's let's say that the usability of the advice I get is definitely improved when I take time over that initial instruction um sometimes I, I feel like I don't have time to do it you know I don't want to spend 30 minutes writing an email explaining the context explaining all the different characters and the and everything but it's hard for somebody in private practice who, you know, operates very much in the legal world still, even if they're fantastic lawyers, they are, um, you know, that's their daily business is, is being a lawyer and, and advising on the law. It's very hard for them to place themselves in your shoes unless you provide them with a good picture. Um, so that, that's probably the thing I took away most from being in-house. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice. And, and one thing we find is that you can you can always give the most effective advice when you have the context because often there's almost always a question behind the question so you know can we do this well will this will the x move be in compliance with financial fair play there's another question that that, that you that you kind of want to know the answer to um so i think that's fantastic advice both for people working in-house and also in private practice um, i'm going to ask some of the questions from from the chat if that's okay um, so Rob Higgins has asked about learning by osmosis, which is something which is, 
I'm sure you've all found it's much more difficult when you're sat in your in your kitchen or in your lounge and not actually in um, you know in the stadium or, or in the office um, and the question is do you feel that you miss out on doing the same within a legal context or, or, or can you only only learn by osmosis um, in, a, in, a, in an in-house role or if you're in a sort of operational role? Puna, what, what do you think on that? Um, so um, I think you can learn by osmosis kind of whether you're in-house or in private practice um, with in-house I think the thing is that you are in you're in an environment where you can hear other people speaking and on the phone and you, people come into your office whether they're speaking to you or whether they're speaking to someone else and um, so you know that obviously helps with kind of understanding what's going on in the club one of the things we do at Chelsea is we make sure as lawyers that we attend a lot of the meetings that are going on even when there is not a specific legal aspect involved so like there are kind of regular monthly or weekly meetings that um certain departments have um you know there are meetings that um we the, the kind of business has kind of in the run-up to a match day um and those are the sorts of things that we join those even if we potentially don't need to advise on anything legally then but it, it just becomes helpful to us as a legal team like for everyone to know kind of what's going on in the club um and that's sort of one way to kind of assist um like we're kind of the whole osmosis process in terms of private practice so as a more junior lawyer like i actually we were in an open plan office and i actually felt like i learned a lot from like listening to the other lawyers that were like around me especially in in terms of like negotiating like what what position is acceptable what's not acceptable um I sat with a couple of really good litigators at the time and like listening to their conversations like mm. you know quite an eye, eye open as to how they handled like really really difficult situations and turn things around so so yeah I, th I think it can happen I think you can learn by osmosis in any sort of environment um even if like the, the kind of skill you'll be learning will be a bit different. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've, I've really missed is just being able to pop your head around someone's door and say, just got a quick question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because what, it, it feels much more invasive when someone's sat at home or you can see they're on a call to drop them a message or to call them and it becomes, it becomes much harder to sort of pick up on cues or, or for, for many people working in private practice, you'll share a room with one or two people and even listening to... Um, to the conversations people have is brilliant. So someone I share a room with, his partner called Adam Rose, he, he, has, he has a line that he uses sometimes where he says, he'll send out a cost estimate to someone and he'll say, please do say if it is too high or indeed too low. He makes the same joke multiple times, <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, it always, always lands well. Um, Puna, we've got another question for, for, you, for you and for Zoe. Um, it's about, did, do you have a background in commercial law prior to joining Chelsea and Southampton, respectively? I think we've, I think we've actually answered that one. Um, yeah. But is there scope for lawyers that qualify in other fields um, to join in-house teams? So could you could you train as a re reputation protection lawyer or, or something else and then still move in-house? Um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I was an intellectual property specialist. So like I did a little bit of commercial work, but my main kind of work was IP and it was IP litigation. So like trademark infringement, copyright infringement, uh, passing off like that, that kind of work. But um, it was really helpful, actually, um, to get into kind of uh, sport like kind of sports because you know like um, a lot of sports brands like their biggest asset is their is their reputation and their brand and the value of their brand um and you know for, for kind of football as well like one of the biggest um kind of your biggest assets is broadcasting like the, the kind of uh, rights to your broadcasting so yeah not quite commercial but like having an ip background did really help in kind of getting into the field and so what about you? What do you think about that? Because you, obviously you're working in planning, so it could have gone could have gone quite a different way. Yeah, oh no, I was offered that. That was what I was that was what was going up alone. I've never actually done any planning work. I have oh, since being you. in house, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, like I said, anything and everything gets thrown at you. Um, yeah, no, I I would I don't think you need to be a straight commercial lawyer to work in house. You know, like I said, we as you deal with pretty much anything and everything, having a different transferable skills like IP or regulatory or brand protection, things like that, they'd all be really, really useful um, skills to have from an in-house environment because no matter what, you'll actually end up using them. Because I, you know, I you touch we touch on all of those points anyway, and I'm not an expert in any of those areas. Yeah. So, you know, you only you learn sort of by osmosis probably more with the the commercial elements but again 
you don't have to be a, a commercial specialist from my point of view to work in-house no yeah and I actually do have a friend who who trained as a finance lawyer so she was a finance lawyer for about four or five years before she went to work for um, like a motor racing company like a big f1 team um, and she um, like yeah obviously she's not a commercial lawyer but she had the kind of negotiation skills and the skills that you get from like kind of dealing with finance documents day in day out fantastic and I think I think because we're in in January at the moment we've had lots of people interested about transfer window and <laughs> um, and what the in-house lawyers do in, in, in the transfer window is you guys are involved in the transfers are you there shaking hands with the players signing the contracts holding up the shirt Emma, I don't, I don't know if you did any any transfer work at, whilst at, at Chelsea and Villa. Um, not in terms of the the sexy work. I didn't do any of the actual <laughs> transfer. I did things like the governing body endorsements, which I had to remember the name of those the other day when I talked to Tom. Um, so the, the, the immigration work behind uh, transfers. I think it was a little bit above my pre, pay grade as a trainee to be, to be handling the, the money transactions. But uh, I mean, I can talk about, um, and, and Puna and Zoe will talk about this um, much more recently, but at the time that I was there, um, most of the transfer work um, at Chelsea was starting to be done in-house. I don't know if it's still the same, um, but Villa was different. But, and, and that just goes again to the to the previous point that I made with you know different commercial realities for the clubs. If you don't have the in-house capacity to handle it, I mean, the transfer window is an incredibly intense period of time for, for everybody involved in the, the commercial side of the club. Um, so if you don't have that in-house capacity, you have to go external. And Zoe, what, what, what's your experiences with that? Do you get involved with transfers much? Uh, not as much really sort of we have quite a we've got a really good club sec uh, club secretary who's been here for 20 I don't know 25 years something something crazy bless her um so she knows everything about football <laughs> football regs and football laws and um so she's a, got a breadth of knowledge so no we've got we kind of have a little mini kind of team between kind of our RMD who's got finance background um my boss who's um sort of our chief legal and risk officer and sort of Roz and then um our sort of sort of the board level kind of get involved from that side so um I have done some in the past as sort of and from transfer agreements I've never done the hat I've never been in a room and held a shirt up and um <laughs> or anything like that I don't think, uh, in the, in the pitch. yeah I think um I'm not sure how much of that would actually happen in reality for 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 us lawyers or um but no it, it is fun to kind of be involved in it's a really interesting area I mean it's it's sort of you know, twice a year as it were but it's it is interesting to to sort of see how it kind of how it works and how it kind of you know comes about and but yeah generally um I don't get that much involved these days unless uh probably unless there's holidays or things like that or they need extra support <laughs> yeah one of the questions we've got through is is about diversity in the sports sector and one thing we haven't said today is that you're obviously all amazing women um and someone's asked whether it's wrong to assume that sports and, and law is is very male dominated um emma what what's your what's your views on this do you find you're often interacting with more men than women or do you or is or is it slowly but surely becoming much more even so maybe i maybe i'll do the more broader sports sector and i'll allow puna and zoe to do the the, the legal side because uh, they've got much more recent experience um from a sports sector perspective um it, you can kind of go up the scale. So from an athlete perspective, it tends to be 50-50 now. Um, that, that's something that the IOC has been looking at for, for the last 10 or so years. It starts to get a little bit less um, equitable um, when you move into things like coaching, technical officials, leadership positions. Um, and if I stick on leadership, it's um, there's, there's room to improve, let's put it that way. I, I think um, the IOC set the target roughly around 30% of women on boards um, or women in senior positions within the international sport federations. I think there's approximately four or five that have met that target. Um, so from, a, an out, from an overall objective perspective, we definitely as a sports sector have a lot of work to do in order to improve uh, equity from a gender perspective. I think there's also a real challenge for the sports sector in terms of diversity and inclusion more broadly. Um, but, you know, there, there are um, 
there are strategies in place. Uh, I think there's not sufficient pathways yet. And, and what I mean by pathways, just to be absolutely clear, is that it's not yet clear for a young girl or young boy or, or whatever coming through the sports sector, what the clear pathway would be to a leadership position. I think that's a challenge the sports sector has always faced, whether you're in a working in-house in a football club or you're working um, in-house in an international federation, you don't have the same career progression structure um, that you would do within, say, a private practice law firm. You know, you training associate, or depending on the terminology, senior associate partner. It's, it's absolutely not that clear. And I think the pathway to the top um, hasn't been... Um, hasn't been articulated well enough um, for people to understand what they need to do in order to get there. And there definitely needs to be further pathways put in place um, in order to see a greater percentage of women at the top of the sport. And Poonam, I wonder if you could touch on your, your role with, with women in football and, and the type of work they do to try and encourage um, greater diversity, it, it, both in, in, in leadership and also touch on, on your experience in, in the law as well. Yeah, no, of course. So I, so I would say, um, like, yes, I mean, working within sport, um, it's still very male dominated. I mean, um, you know, it's very normal for me to walk into a meeting or be on a call with like seven people and I would be the only, I'll be the only female on that call. Um, it is changing though. Like I've definitely noticed a shift. Like I definitely think that, um, you know, there's a there's a much bigger emphasis, especially because sport is so much more professionalized now on getting the best people and getting the best talent. And um, I think I think um, clubs and maybe other organisations as well are starting to look at kind of having a more diverse workforce and what they can do to make sure that they are recruit, recruiting the best people. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of a work in progress. Um, and yes, like kind of what Emma touched on is like it's it's the kind of senior leadership positions where like um, most of the change needs to take place. And um, so Women in Football um, is an organisation based in the UK, but um, it's basically set up to kind of help women within the sports industry and um, progress their careers um, and one of the kind of initiatives that they introduced last year was a um, a director development program so um, it would allow one person to um, observe the women in football board for a year and shadow them um, and the aim of it is to get more women comfortable and experience and, and the experience to then go after a board position within sport um, so luckily last year I, I mean I was one that was chosen to to join them um, and yeah it's been a brilliant experience um, you know uh, it's it's, it's about kind of like attending the board meetings, understanding kind of like the more strategic roles, uh, the st strategic kind of objectives that um, an organization might have. Um, so sort of, yeah, like understanding how the different um, parts of a business operate. So, you know, the kind of financial side and the operational side, but also, you know, like how, you know, how, how businesses think about generating revenue and, um, you know, how they, how businesses think about like, um, positioning their brand um, so just kind of getting that experience is really good and I think I think um, yeah these types of board shadowing schemes are really really useful um, and yeah the more that kind of organizations will do them um, I think I think would be would kind of be beneficial for for the industry as a whole. And Zoe what's, what's your thoughts on this is football and law still an old, an old boys club or are people finally waking up to the fact that having a more diverse leadership board actually improves decision making, reduce risks and, and makes the makes the place a better workplace overall. Yeah, I mean, I've got very similar experience to, to Poonan, you know, um, five years ago when I joined the club, it was a very, it was very different, um, very sort of different place. Um, we have diversified a lot um, and there are there are more women in more senior kind of positions. Um, but yes, we there is a there is an awareness I think like everywhere that there needs to be a lot more and you know we can do a lot better um in terms of the board um that is obviously um it's 90 percent male um apart from one of our um, owners um so it's you know there is a lot there is a lot of work to be done um but what's positive for me is having seen how that there has been a shift you know that I'm not I'm not just sort of one of the what um, you know at one point I think there was only one other sort of my level 
sort of a senior, a mid-level senior sort of manager. Um, and I was thinking, wow, this is nuts. Um, but that has improved a lot. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I think it's just one of those things that it's not an old boys club anymore, but it's not completely gone. That's probably... Yeah. And do, you, and do you think we're, we're, we're doing enough both in sport and law to encourage people not only of different of, of different genders but also to of more diverse backgrounds both in terms of, of race ethnicity and and more important well equally as importantly sort of class which is often sort of brushed under the carpet one of the, one of the one of the reasons why we've tried to set up the sports academy is to try and showcase that there's lots of different people from lots of different different backgrounds who have an mm-hmm. opportunity in in sport but um, I think certainly from my perspective, you still sort of look around and, and, and see, particularly if you look at, look at the bar, it's uh, not very representative of, of, the, of the community. Um, and it feels like there's still, there's still quite a lot of work that, that can be done there. I think fo- yeah. football, football is fantastic is because at least on the pitch, you can see, you know, we actually have, it's, it's, it's really quite representative of, of society. Um, yeah. But that doesn't necessarily carry across when you, when you move into sort of leader, leadership positions. Yeah, no, and I, I do think that that is fair to say, um, you know, and I think there is there is sort of a lot of work going on in, in our sort of club around, you know, diversification and how we can encourage everybody and everybody to apply for roles and you know my team actually got um a little bit of sort of I'll say stick um because we're all female and I hadn't really you know so we're the other way um so um we're sort of an all-female which again isn't purposeful but it's just how it's ended up landing um but it, it, it can be interesting to see sort of my experience from kind of when we were recruited recently you know female kind of position um female applicants were a lot on the heavier side than the male applicants so it felt like which I thought in a way I I expected there to be more male applicants and um but there there wasn't I was thinking oh you know it'd be great if we can get a man into the team and you know change it up a little bit but actually there wasn't at the time um there wasn't a lot of um a lot coming through that's really interesting um we're going to try and do a quick fire set of questions because we've got about about eight minutes left. So Pina, I've got a question for you. Have you been able to use your impressive language skills at Chelsea at all? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if so, have they come in handy? And if you could talk through the, the different languages you speak, that'd be great. Um, so um, in terms of like what I actually speak, so I did, so um, I'm, I'm like in Indian origin. So Gujarati is my mother tongue um, and I obviously speak English. Um, I did French and Italian at school. I did French and German at university. And then when I left university, I spent some time learning Spanish in South America. And then I did um, like my six months in Rio. So, so I caught, like picked up Portuguese. Um, in terms of like, um, like, do I use my languages at Chelsea? I mean, um, it's not something that I use on a regular basis, but every now and again, something crops up where your language skills are useful. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that um, like comes, comes across every day, but like every now and again, it will come across. Um, I would say though that like, my language skills I, I believe like have generally been very positive for my career overall like I think it's really helped like having the perspective of living in a, in a foreign country like you know I, I was able to spend six months in a foreign office um, I've definitely I do remember when I was in private practice like there were some opportunities I had that happened because I spoke a language like the best one that I remember actually was um, going to Morocco to interview witnesses um uh because I spoke French and we yeah it was just you know an amazing experience um to, to kind of to do that so um yeah I think like, like having language skills do come in handy throughout your career um it's not something you might use on a day-to-day basis but it's something that can um give you opportunities as a like you know when you least expect it brilliant and quick fire question to Zoe uh what are you most excited about uh, about working on this year and whilst you're having to think about that I'm going to ask Emma what's been the highlight of your career so far oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, only got, you only got 30 right seconds so I'm gonna have to I, actually, I think when I asked that to Zoe I was like god I'm glad I didn't get that question <laughs> it was even worse. um highlight of my career I mean I so so I'll, I'll, I'll take two and I'll think about the second while I'm answering the first, which is more obvious. Um, I didn't achieve everything I set out to in, in my career in sports, but um, representing your country and particularly when I did it at the Commonwealth Games in India, 
there's um no matter what sport you're in, I mean, I mean, we're badminton, we don't have, uh, you know, the thousands of people going out to watch footballers, but there has been no greater professional experience or, or pride than doing that. Um, so, so definitely that was one for me. And from a professional perspective, um, I actually, I'm not certain this is the right answer, but given we've just been talking about gender equity, I think um, being re-elected to the World Badminton Federation board, um, you know, I'm the youngest on the board uh by about 20 30 years and yeah. um, god nobody's listening in case that's actually wrong and they're younger than i think they are and <laughs> and uh yeah definitely um and, and um you know one of only five six women sorry excuse me so i think um for me from a professional perspective um that was a good achievement fantastic and zoe what are you most excited on working on this year well that's <laughs> That's not the easiest question, only because some stuff I can't talk about and then other stuff um, isn't kind of announced publicly. <laughs> um, you can skip so, it if you like. Sorry? You can skip it if you like. <laughs> I mean, there's a few things that we're doing kind of as a team um, in terms of kind of regulatory kind of um, audits and things, which might not sound very exciting, but actually we're really excited about um, in doing. But there's a lot of stuff commercially that's, that's coming up and um, sort of, that I'm really excited about coming out, but obviously I can't really talk about so it. Watch this space at Southampton because there's going to be some exciting yeah, there's, announcements. There's a lot. Of, there's a, we're working on some really cool stuff, and um, yeah, watch this space. So I'm ex I'm excited about a lot of that coming to fruition as we've been working on a lot of it for over a year. So oh, brilliant! And Poonam, do do football teams or football clubs offer um, in-house training contracts at all? I, I know Chelsea have got quite a relatively big team compared to others so do, mm -hmm. do you offer in-house training contracts um no we don't um yeah it's just not something that we do um i mean we we do have a secondi that comes in from a law firm um every now and again so um so yeah that that's um pretty much what we do but no in i think um like to kind of set up as a in-house organization um for, for training contracts i think there's certain requirements that you need to fulfill and I, and I know some in I know some companies do it but I'm not aware that many football clubs if any um do you have um in-house training mm -hmm. or do you have one yeah we we um we do but um we don't advertise it outside if that you know we we tend to the last sort of two we've done it, done it twice um so far but the last two that we've had have kind of been from uh paralegal roles um so it's never been a guaranteed that it would happen but we like to have you know and we've put both of them through training contracts but and then sent our trainee generally off to in the past we have sent one of the trainees into private practice for a few months as well so just to try and get a bit of a varied experience but this year um <laughs> my trainee hasn't had the opportunity because of covid unfortunately but um there's lots of stuff she's doing so hopefully she's uh <laughs> she's fulfilling all of that anyway <laughs> Um, Emma, I've got two questions. Two questions for you. Uh, firstly, do you think it's, it's benefited you having a background as a professional athlete um, in your career? And secondly, because you've had two really super exciting comments, what tips do you have to be for how to secure a comment? Okay, the first one. Um, yes, I, I would say having a background in sport has helped my career. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's an absolute requirement though for working in, in sports law, not at all. I think where it has helped um, a couple of things. First, the soft skills. Um, not to go to, too in depth, but you know it's drilled into you as an athlete. Um, things that come naturally, like goal setting. Um, you, you know, attention to detail, determination, grit, all these types of things, they're inbuilt in you from a very early age. So, so I think the soft skills help. And then on the business side, for somebody aiming to work in sports law, having an understanding or just sort of an inherent knowledge, I didn't even know it would be useful in future of what the Olympic movement is, how that structure operates, who are the runners and riders. Um, you know, that was also incredibly helpful. The reason I say I don't think it's absolute is soft skills you can always develop and train yourself. Um, and the business um, insights and expertise, you know, you can build it up working in a law firm or, or you can build it up through voluntary positions. I mean, the sports sector, obviously at the minute, it's facing many different challenges, but there's opportunities to, to, to build up knowledge of sport and sport industries and sport businesses without ever having been an athlete. Certainly it's never helped my career knowing how to run a beep, beep test. That's never, never been relevant in law at any stage or 
or in my career now. So, you know, there's some bits that are completely useless. Um, and then remind me what the second question was. Sorry, I forgot. On tips on how to secure a secondment. Yeah, so that's this a little difficult one for me because our secondments, as I mentioned earlier, were really secured by the partners. And I'm not quite sure if that's the way it normally works in other law firms, having, having never been there. Um, so th the way it would operate would be that a secondment would come up, would be offered as a, relation as a result of the relationship of a partner with a particular client. Mm. Um, then typically the internal process was that you would make an application and be interviewed. And that was the same as uh, when I first went to Chelsea um, on that it's very similar to to any application you do and, and um, it, it's basic so sorry if it's a little bit boring but it, it's probably also helpful take your time actually properly answer the questions that have been asked try to relate your answers to both the advantage to the business so at that time it would be a private sector a private practice uh, firm and, and and try to relate what you can bring as an individual um, not just to your firm but also to the to the to the client that you're going to because that's the slight nuance about being on secondment yes you're you're working for the client um but you're also reflecting uh, the business that you're you're an employee of so sorry to sum that up take time on your application tailor it to both your business uh, sorry your, your firm and the client that you're going to and there we go fantastic piece of advice to end it today Guys, for those who've asked questions if we haven't been able to answer, I'm, I'm very sorry. We have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I just want to say a massive thank you to Poonam, to Zoe and, and to Emma. Um, you've been really fantastic. And I knew this was going to be an exciting talk. I was, I was really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, for those of you looking out for, for the next session of the Sports Law Academy, um, we've actually got two sessions coming up in February, one of which is in partnership with, with Littleton, Littleton Chambers, um, which is, looks at employment issues in sports. And we're going to be touching on some different issues we haven't quite sort of talked about yet um, from an employment law perspective and also talking about brands. Um, the second session we're running in conjunction with an esports team called Fanatic, um, who are the, the Real Madrid of esports in, in the UK. And we have their general counsel and a trainee who's joining us. Um, we'll also be producing three different videos about IP in, in, and, uh, in gaming and, and esports for you to, to watch. Um, so thank you very much for those for joining us today. A recording of this will be available afterwards. Please feel free to sh share with your friends and your colleagues. And thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.